In our first of our programs on bonding, we're going to take a look at ionic bonds and the formation of ionic crystals. First off, ionic bonds in general form between metals and nonmetals. Metals tend to lose electrons and as a result develop positive charges. Here in the periodic table, we can see the most common charges developed by some of the representative elements, starting off with lithium and beryllium at plus one and plus two, and then moving over to aluminum and silicon at three plus and four plus. Nonmetals, on the other hand, tend to gain electrons, and as a result, tend to develop negative charges. And here we can see the most common charges for some of the nonmetals. Negative three for nitrogen, two minus for oxygen, one minus for fluorine. An ionic bond happens when these two species get together, a metallic ion and a non-metallic ion, and the electrostatic attraction results in the ionic bond. For instance, sodium with chlorine. Here I have sodium's electron configuration and chlorine's. Sodium has a tendency to lose that 3s electron, and as a result, obtains the noble gas configuration of, say, neon. Chlorine, on the other hand, gaining the electron, develops the electron configuration of argon. That then results in the formation of species that have opposite charges. These opposite charges attract and form the ionic bond. Generally speaking, we tend to classify ionic bonds as substances that have differences of electronegativity of greater than 1.88. In this case, I have the electronegativity of sodium is 0.9, chlorine 3.2, a difference of 2.3. And as a result, these tend to form bonds that are ionic in character. The most ionic combination would occur between these two elements, fluorine and francium, at opposite ends or opposite diagonals of the periodic table. The closer elements are to each other, the less ionic the bond tends to be. Let's look a little bit at naming and formulas of ionic compounds. Here I'll start off with magnesium with bromine. The first thing I do is identify the most common charge developed by these species. Magnesium 2 plus, bromine 1 minus. The next step is to balance the charges, meaning the pluses and the negatives must balance. That requires the presence of two bromines to balance the charge of the magnesium. Some of you might recall this as something called the crisscross rule that's taught sometimes in younger grades, thereby we take the coefficient, or at least the magnitude of the charges, and we apply them to the opposite ion. And that then gives a formula of magnesium bromine with two uh, bromines. The formula changes its name from magnesium bromine to magnesium bromide to indicate an ionic bond. We also ensure at this point that we have the subscripts in the lowest terms. In this case, we do. A 1 to 2 ratio is in lowest terms. Now, I'm going to point out at this point that magnesium bromide is not a molecule. It's what we call a formula unit, and it simply reflects the ratio of the ions that are present in the crystal or the crystal lattice that it forms. There is no entity that's got one magnesium with two bromines attached to it. Instead, it's a large conglomerate of ions whereby the ratio is two to one, two bromine ions for every magnesium ion. Let's try another example, magnesium with oxygen. Again, I identify their most common charges using the periodic table, and I'll apply the crisscross rule to ensure that the, number, that the charges balance. Thereby, the formula would be magnesium two, oxygen two. That can be reduced to lowest terms and form magnesium oxide. Therefore, in the ionic crystal, the ratio of magnesium to oxygen ions would be one to one and perhaps would look something like this. Let's bump up the rules a bit for ionic compounds. Some ionic compounds contain substances that have more than one charge. We call these multivalent ions. Here are a few of them. By and large, the transition metals tend to have the most numerous uh, types of valences or charges. Let's consider iron then with oxygen. If iron takes on the two plus charge, and thereby we apply the crisscross rule, the formula of our compound would be iron oxide, one iron to one oxygen. If however, iron takes on the three plus charge, and we apply the crisscross rule to balance the charges, the formula would be Fe2 O3. Now, both these compounds can't share the same name because they have different properties. To differentiate, we include in the name the most charge that's being used in that species. So here you can see in brackets the first compound will be called iron 2 oxide and the second 
iron three oxide. We also have groups of atoms which can develop charges. We call these polyatomic ions. And these you need to commit to memory. Let's look at the combination of aluminum with what is called a carbonate ion. Again, I identify their charges, apply the crisscross rule to ensure that the charges balance each other, and that gives me the formula with aluminum with three carbonates. Notice the use of brackets in the use of this compound. Brackets are important when you have more than one of a polyatomic ion present. The properties of these compounds. First of all, in the solid form, they're very poor conductors of electricity. Conduction requires the presence of compounds or at least species that are free to move. So either the ions have to be free to move or electrons have to be free to move. In this case, the ions are locked in the crystal lattice and not free to move. So as a solid, it's a very poor conductor. However, if I melt the substance or dissolve it, those ions are broken free of the ionic network and allowed to freely roam around and therefore the substance does become a better conductor. Most ionic compounds are soluble in water. Let's take a look at the water molecule. The water molecule is what we call a polar molecule, possessing a positive and a negative end. In this case, the positive sodium ion can attract the negative end of the water molecule in an electrostatic attraction. <coughs> so can others. This results in numerous bonds then between the water molecules and the sodium ion. And similarly, if we turn the hydrogen ends towards the chlorine, we can develop an attraction there. So the ability of water to bond with these ions makes ionic compounds generally very soluble. Lastly, ionic bonds tend to be very high melting points and not very volatile. Volatile means easily evaporated. So for instance, sodium and chlorine require 801 degrees Celsius to melt or break that ionic attraction. If we change the species involved, magnesium with oxygen, the use of substances with higher charges results in a greater electrostatic attraction. That greater electrostatic attraction results in a higher temperature required to break the bonds. So by increasing the charges involved, we can also increase the strength. This strength is also affected by distance. If I can reduce the distance between my ions, I can also improve the strength. So this serves as an introduction to ionic compounds. In our next program, we'll look at a different way that atoms can share their electrons, called covalent bonds. Thanks for watching, and questions are welcome.